you very much. Okay, so um, I've had uh, some personal things going on in my life, so I'm very sorry if this talk is a little disorganized, but I promise uh, I will, it will have the content that I want to talk about. Um, so thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. I started in blockchain in 2014 when I started uh, Tendermint because I was fascinated and really enthusiastic about Bitcoin ever since 2013. And I realized that proof of work consensus had to be replaced with something else, but there was nothing that could solve the proof, the nothing at stake problem. So Tendermint um, uh, happened by uh, digging through you know, uh, uh, computer science research papers, and there happened to be some BFT consensus papers by DARPA. So, um, so now Tendermint is used in a lot of in a lot of these proof of stake blockchains, including the Binance chain and even um, Ethereum uh, 2.0. Like they 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 understand Tendermint and they acknowledge it. So it's uh, it's become a big deal. Um, and then, on top of that, um, we worked on Cosmos. So Cosmos. It's an internet of blockchains. The idea is to connect blockchains together um, by allowing blockchains to communicate to each other securely through packets or messages, basically through Merkle proofs. Um, and Tendermint really enabled that because classical BFT consensus like Tendermint makes like client proofs really easy. Okay, so I was working on that. <clears throat> we were working on that and, and then 2020 came around, and, and there was all this, all this drama. And, um, and I started to realize, I don't, know, I don't know people at all, and I don't know what's going on, but um, the world is really strange, and they start to get these feelings that maybe a lot of the people in this space are not really looking out for the best interest of everyone else. Maybe they're just kind of greedy, and most people are just kind of perhaps psychopathic. Um, if they're in a space about blockchains and money and they're entrepreneurs, you know, I mean, they're driven, yes, but they're greedy. And um, I experienced a lot by meeting and working with these, with these people. I mean, there are very good people that I've met who are interested in the technology and want to build and make the world a better place. But most people that you will meet after you build your company will probably want to just take what you build and make money off of it, sell it and then leave you in the dust. So um, this talk is going to be about tying all those things together. All right, so after um, I experienced a lot of drama in Cosmos, I realized what we need is not a token-based system. We do need that, but we need a lot more. Uh, namely, we need a better culture. We need better understanding. We need to cut through the bullshit um, that's created this matrix that's created by the deep state and you know all that in order to confine us and um, and I realized there are no good tools um, that we can really use today that do this I mean you know back in the day people were making like reddit forks you know if you were into web 2.0 programming you would start off just making like a reddit fork just for fun right but there's literally nothing on the market where you can just create your own reddit clone they're set it, but it's almost like every one of these things get bought out in order to be removed. Um, and and I'll, I'll show you more and more about, you know, what kind of information I'm talking about. But like, I'm just so sick of the censorship, guys. That um, I think what we, well, I know that what we need is not a financial DeFi application on the blockchain. Yes, we need that. But first and foremost, we need a information discovery. Uh, 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 a blockchain that enables truth to be conveyed, okay? And what I mean is what I'm going to talk about. So I started working on NoLand. Um, and, uh, and the thesis with NoLand is you start with a language, um, a general purpose language such as Go, um, and you can actually build a metaverse that is purely based on logic and code, right? And you can, uh, and what we've done is um, create a new paradigm of computing that uh, even could be ported back into Web 2.0. 
Yeah, let's dive into it. Okay, so that's me. All right. Um, why? I'll go into more. Um, I'm actually going to, in the middle of this talk, show you like a really scattered presentation. And I'm going to show you the presentation that I want to give, but I can't because we don't have the tools. And if I were to give that presentation without the tooling, I would just sound like a crazy person. <laughs> all right? Um, all right, so like I was saying, this world is uh, not what it seems. Everything is upside down. How many people just know this already and believe that you know, we're all being gaslit constantly? All right, who, 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 who disagrees? Who thinks, like, okay. All right, well, most people see that we're all being gaslit, and it's, it's true. I mean, okay. um, there really is a deep state. Whether or not they're really trying to depopulate you or not, I don't know, but they certainly have been running these programs, um, including the lockdowns and so on, and it was all planned for decades. And there were whistleblowers. You just don't know about them because they're all censored. It's crazy, the information is out there, you just don't know. For example, um, representative, U.S. Representative McDonald in 1985 whistle blew live on TV that the uh, Rockefeller Foundation, the Trilateral Commission, and the uh, Council on Foreign Affairs was planning a long, decades-long coup to take over the world. Guess what? 2019, Rockefeller Foundation puts out the lockstep pamphlet, and it happens to the T. You know? I mean, like, if the information is out there, it's all true. What we need, though, is we need to cut through the censorship barrier, and we have to display the information in a way that people can understand it. Then all of our problems will almost just get solved because our problems are contingent on censorship. And information is easy to copy. So in other words, as soon as we have an information platform, kind of like a new age future Wikipedia that is better because it is not centralized, and it is better because instead of censoring, it allows moderators to split, right? And creates diversity of moderation and, and views. Through a permissionless um, implement, you know, a, a experimentation of smart contracts and code and structures, we will be able to find and create the new version of Wikipedia that densely linked, hyperlinked knowledge tree that will be able to quickly bring anyone, you know, be able to convince them that, yeah, you live in an upside down world, okay? So that's what No Land is about. I'm gonna skip over it for time's sake. Just really quickly, GNO is the language. It's basically like a fork of Go 1.17 before generics. I chose that language because uh, it's really simple. I like simple spec languages, but it's also safe. So like C is simple, and that's, that's why it's so great. But it's not safe, it's not memory safe. And Go is memory safe. It's supremely object-oriented in the sense that it is based on embeddable structures and, and handles that really well. And it ties in concurrency in a language that no other language had done before and we now live in a parallel multiprocessor world. So Go, I found to be the language that we should um, commit to for a while, kind of like Greece, uh, Coin Greek was way back in the day, you know? Go is the language. So GNO is the language. The GNO VM, I'll show you, is the virtual machine that interprets the Go or the GNO abstract syntax tree, and I'll talk more about that. And GNO.land is a blockchain that is basically like Ethereum, except instead of the EVM, we have the GNO VM. Okay, and let's go into it. So what is GNO? GNO is just interpreted Go. You can think of it that way, though in the future, I'm sure you know it doesn't have to be interpreted per se, but um, so what are its properties? It's not just Go. It's really special in that, uh, 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 several things. One, uh, it, there's no bytecode intermediary. Everything, so what I try to do is when I program, is I try to make things super intuitive so that uh, you don't have to learn anything that is not intuitive. You know what I mean? So that way we can have a minimal stack 
from tendermint consensus to you know, the SDK to the smart contract, virtual machine to the application, all of it. Imagine all of that in just one language and as simple and as intuitive possible so that anyone who wants to learn programming in a university setting or anywhere can just understand how this works. And they will understand not just how programming works, but they would also understand how to create their own civilization with their own financial infrastructure and censorship tolerant information network and so on. That's what we're trying to get at and that's what we can do. Um, all right, so intuitive is a huge thing for me. That's why there's no byte code. It's, uh, it's, it's all based on the AST and it's all based on Go. Um, another thing is there's no persistence. What I mean is this. Our computers are designed with two tiers of memory. We've got RAM and we've got disk. And if you restart your computer, your RAM resets, right? So these are two types of memories. And so everything is kind of based on this paradigm. But in the future, we're, we don't need to have this distinction because we're going to have memristors, you know, the HP invented thing. Basically, your RAM is going to be persistent. And that should come with a completely different paradigm of programming that doesn't even have databases or ORMs or file systems because you don't need them. Now you can just have the language, and only the language. And uh, of course, you can, you can construct file systems and databases and use those APIs, but you don't need to because your instantiations, your instances in memory of structures, or arrays, of uh, maps and slices and all that, they are automatically persistent. You see what I mean? OK. So I, and imagine if not, not only that, but everything also automatically Merkleized at the end of a transaction. OK, so here's here are two more concepts. In GNU, um, you don't just run a program forever. Everything is transactional. It's a transactional computing paradigm. Okay? Um, and so that's why it fits nicely into the blockchain, obviously, but it's not just useful in the blockchain setting. You can also use it for Web 2.0. Um, and in the future, in the long future, once we have memristors and everything, yeah, you, you'll be you know, writing no, you'll, you'll be writing future proof code. <laughs> Simple as that. Just wait 20 years. Okay. Um, so no lang is like go lang. Um, it's, I didn't make this one, so let's read some of these. Easy to learn. Sorry, what time is that? How much time do I have left? OK, great. Easy to learn. Yeah, it's, it's got the most adoption. I mean, I'm telling you, I've, I've been a language geek for a long time. I've been working on Before Go, my favorite language was CoffeeScript. But like, you know, I also wrote an EVM virtual machine a long time ago, which became the Monax, Eris, Burrow virtual machine. Um, um, also worked on, yeah, basically a coffee script interpreter, which, anyways. So I've been working on language for a long time. In fact, I was actually working on languages for blockchains, and I was working on language for a whole year in my room before I realized I didn't have any money left. And I thought, I should do this, but closer to money, and things will just work out. All right, that's how I got started. So now I'm going back to languages, because that's what I love. Um, OK, so for blockchains, Let's skip over for a bit. What is GNU? OK, so GNU, VM. Um, OK, yeah, everything's deterministic. Our program, our CPU architecture, and our languages, and our concurrency system, they're all designed to be non-deterministic, almost by design, maybe because the DOD doesn't want us to have BFT systems for missile systems, you know? I mean, like Tendermint, the BFT consensus algorithm that these blockchains use now, was based on DARPA research for missile systems. You know, understand, right? And so they don't really want us using this. But um, so that's why they don't want determinism because they don't want they don't want your missiles going somewhere you want, right? Anyways, source parse. Okay, so like I said, GNU VM interprets the AST, and and what that means is you don't have to learn this intermediary system, you, you know, because anyone who knows programming enough already understands the AST. And the AST, the abstract syntax tree. It's just a tree of nodes of the elements of the code, maps, I mean, like if statements, you know, statements, expressions, um, you know, uh, constant expressions, loops, 
and so on, function calls. You know, these are all the intuitive components of the language. It's like, as, like nouns, verbs, adjectives. You, know, you have to learn grammar before you really graduate school, right? So you already know the AST, or you should, and then you don't need a bytecode. If you have a bytecode, if you have an AST interpreter. I don't know, I've never seen anything like it, but I built it because I wanted it. Now it's awesome. Um, you should check it out. Okay, so it automatically persists. Anything in memory just stays forever. So, so in other words, imagine a GNO program um, is, is kind of, yeah. Um, so it's, it is a different paradigm of programming because uh, you, know, you usually never have to worry about, you know, usually when you, when you instantiate something or you, you might have a memory leak, it's not such a big deal, right? Because you can just restart your application and it'll still work, right? If you program it right. Well, you don't have to do that anymore, but, you know, um, uh, so you, your program, your application can be very succinct and it can just have the pure logic that you want to express and need to express without DBs or ORMs or anything. Um, yeah, and it auto merkleizes which means um, you can prove any state in no land through, uh, through a Merkle proof, you know? So we don't have to do like IBC, like in Cosmos, they, you know, we, have, um, we have packets of information going from one place to another, from blockchain to another so to send coins, right? Um, but you can do better than that with GNO because you can just read the state of the blockchain. So it's a difference between like me communicating with you through the words I give you versus you just reading my body language, you know? There's different kinds of IBC that we have yet to explore. So I call IBC2 what is possible as an IBC implementation in smart contracts in GNOME, because you can do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna skip a bit here and I'm gonna go into, I'm gonna go into the presentation that I kind of want to give, because it's not about just the code. Um, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're all here, or a lot of the people here, you're here because you want to create something interesting and presumably because you want to be made, right? Do something in the world. Um, and that's also why I was in blockchain. I mean, if I look back at why I started, it was because, because Soros started the Asian IMF crisis while I was living in Korea. And my dad uh, lost his job because uh, Daewoo uh, had an issue because of the exchange rate with the dollar. And, uh, and then after we got here, there was the housing crisis. And then um, I realized banking really sucks. And zero hedge is right. Um, and I realized we need to build something better. Um, well, I want to show you um, a little more about what I went through so that while you're building your projects, you don't make the same mistakes I do. And at the same time, you will start to see uh, a glimpse of what I want to build and what I want to convey and why I'm building Nolan. So I'm gonna just, uh, oh here, before I do that, you know, here's an example. Solidity in Ethereum is great in the smart contract program because it allows you to express your smart contract so succinctly compared to, say, programming the Cosmos SDK or something that uses perhaps WASM. You know? uh, and GNOME is the same way because uh, of everything I've just mentioned. I mean, something that would require three lines would require a lot more lines than just about anything else except Ethereum Solidity. Okay? All right, I'm going to keep skipping over. Now, I'm going to show you a bunch of mind map slides that are ill-prepared, but um, and I'm going to talk, and I'm going to sound a little crazy. If you, if you, if you, well, I'm going to sound a little crazy whether you look at the slides or not. <laughs> but um, the point is, what I'm trying to get at is, I want to build this system so that next time I or someone else tries to give this talk, there are slides that show in rich detail what I'm talking about, kind of like a future, you know, screenshot from the future of Wikipedia, right? Um, and, uh, and hopefully you'll get a, a, an understanding of what I'm trying to get at. Because after I experienced what I did in 2020 and after COVID lockdowns and after I went down every single rabbit hole I could find, 
I realized it's, the you know, some of those are true, and we need to work on those right now because it's imminent, okay? So here's the state of the world. Here's how I see of it. There's clown world, which we are in right now. It's also called a new world order, you know, the same as the old world order. Um, you know, just uh, rich people getting richer and controlling and having total domination, right? Just like the song, Oliver Anthony, uh, Richmond, North of Richmond. How many people have heard that one? Yeah? How many people have not heard and, uh, Oliver Anthony's Rich Men Over Richmond? Okay. Um, look it up, Rich Men Over Rich. It's the guy with the red beard. Um, and the cool thing is, that song got zero airplay because the world wants to censor that guy. It's despite the fact that his song is good and it touches people, the reason why you don't hear it on the radio is because um, the system wants to censor him. And despite zero airplay, it reached number one in iTunes because it resonated with people. Um, you know, and it's because, and every time this kind of thing happens where you know, there's some kind of movement or some kind of thing about rich versus poor and class division, you then get more psyops. Like, after Occupy Wall Street, we got all divided by racial this and that, all kinds of things, right? They split us up. After Richmond, north of Richmond, they burned Maui down. I think it was a, I think it was a burn sacrifice and, and it's trying to traumatize us again as a nation, just so that we don't talk about that song and have any ideas. You know what I mean? Uh, and if you look into the actual facts of what happened, such as how police didn't let cars come out and basically kill people, uh, and how the police chief of Maui at the time was also the same police chief who was in Vegas during the Vegas shootings, and there's like so many other things, you know? I mean, once you go down one of these rabbit holes and realize this crazy thing is actually true, uh, everything else starts to make more sense. <laughs> your, your mind becomes open to a lot more else, right? But in order to be convinced of it, you have to first choose so much data, but no one has the time to do that. But if you condense it into a hyperlinked thing, you can, you can dive into something randomly and actually verify yourself that that one small thing is true. And every time you dive in, it's true, it's true, it's true. And you know empirically, um, probabilistically, that the whole thing is true. And that's what we can, that's what I want to create in no land. That's what we need in no land. Something like that, that derives an information tree and manages permissionless annotations in such a way that despite people with different opinions and perspectives, you can construct views of reality um, based on profiles, based on profiles of um, um, censors or moderators and their preferences, but also allowing for these profiles to split and allowing for these profiles to be more local, while we all have a shared common underlying store. Anyways, so like, I mean, I can talk about <laughs> Chad. I call him Chad. So we're, we're still in Nebit N Chad's dream. If you don't know what I'm talking about, um, you, should, you should read about it. And it's, you know, if you've seen The Matrix, you've seen that you know, they're riding on the ship, Neb Nebuchadnezzar. And the reason, you should read a scripture from the Old Testament because it's interesting. Because what's happening is we are finally at the late stages of that story about civilizations. And by the way, yeah, in order to understand what I'm talking about, you have to get this thing called um, Adam's Synchronological History Map. Is that, do you know, does anyone know what I'm talking about? The Synchronological, okay. Oh gosh. Um, you go to Amazon and search for Adam's synchronological history map. What it is, is uh, it's, it's a map of time starting from like 5,000 years ago to like the present day. And it spans from this area to, to like the end of here. And every single, you know, you just see civilization after civilization falling, rising, falling, rising. And you see Rome just towards the end here. And there's all this other stuff that we had forgotten, but it's just condensed in scripture. That's why scripture is important, because we've been through so many iterations of empires and civilizations, and we've learned something. That's why these scriptures are important. 
But we live in a world now where it's, you're, you're, you're deemed crazy if you even refer to those things. Oh, those are just ancient things, right? They're just ancient texts. Why would you even refer to them? It's because we live in a world that's trying to make us forget so that they can control us and gain total domination over us, so that they can enslave us, so that they can be our masters. And this is Babylon. You understand? The Jews escaped Babylon captivity, right? Because in Babylon, they were doing all kinds of things, including, uh, I don't know, just degenerate shit, right? Um, and they want to bring that back. It's been, it's been like that. That's all it is. That's why everything is so crazy. It's because we've been living in more or less of a Christian world, you know, and it's the truth. In the 1500s, the Vatican owned all of, right? All right. Anyways, so you see, no, I, I just sound crazy. And, you know, there's not enough rich, you know. But once this thing is done, as I'm talking about it, imagine if you can see what I'm talking about and that everything I say is backed with truth. All right, now, I'm gonna, just going to, sorry, don't try to read that. Memoristers, yeah, I mean, I want to talk about language and the relationship between the Celtic language and Koine Greek and Hebrew and English and even Korean. Gosh, I want to talk about, I want to talk about, you know, I want to talk about mammon versus knowledge. I want to talk about why we should not focus on DeFi right now, but focus on knowledge systems. Uh, and I want to say, look, uh, the freaking Jesus said this 2,000 years ago, you know, um, and he's right. <laughs> I want to talk about, um, you know, the Ark of the Covenant. And it's, it's a very small one, crazy one. None of the depictions of the Ark of the Covenant in popular media are right because none of them are according to spec. The, sh the wings of the cherubim should overcover the Ark and the mercy seat. Why don't they show the proper thing? I don't know. Anyways, I'm going to go on. This is actually what I prepared. There's a lot of things I want to show blockchain engineers and people who want to enter this space. I, I, I want them to know everything that I've learned because it's... It's key. But if I just talk about it without the backing data, I just sound like a religious nut, you know? The book of Revelation is so pertinent to today. In fact, it was written for multiple periods of time, but especially today, you know? And I can talk about, for example, the Revelation 12 prophecy. Revelation verse 12 talks about a lady with moon on her feet and 12 stars above her head, clothed with the sun, you know, birthing, you know, and, and, about, and, and the baby about to be eaten. But this is an astrological encrypted date timestamp for decentralized coordination of Byzantine fault tolerant um, societal coordination. You know what I mean? Um, and, and that verse, Revelation 12, refers to a particular date because if you look at all of those qualities before and after thousands of years, it, 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 the, the only time that all of those things um, match up is 2017, September 23rd. Now, it, this is interesting because it ties in with everything else that's going on according to the book of Revelation, including the mark of the beast, including even Elon Musk renaming Twitter to x.com. Believe me, it's all related. And the fact that he's related to Freemasons and the Illuminati, he even says so, according to what he wears, and the fact that the Freemasons, their logo is a compass and square, and is actually two X's, and how what they're trying to bring back is the really ancient Akkadian moon god, Sin, whose name is spelled XXX. Now, I just sound crazy right now, right? But the book of Revelation is talking about this temple of X, 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 X. And it's got these characters, the harlot of Babylon, the first beast, the second beast, the second beast that administers the mark of, of the beast so that in order to buy or sell or travel anywhere, you needed to get the vaccine mandate, right? Um, and people are playing into this, and it's all in plain sight. But people are ignorant because we don't know what they're thinking because they're censoring it. And so they do it openly and mock us and think they're better than us. But really, the reason why this is happening is because 
we just haven't yet built the censorship-resistant knowledge conveyance tools. But it's coming. It's going to come in a year. It'll be done in a year. And then we will never live under the kind of censorship regime we've lived under ever again. I want to talk about the Jubilee. And I want to talk about how the number 50 is important. I want to talk about how sound is important in the second coming. I want to, I want to describe the second coming in logical terms so that you understand why people can say these things that seem surreal, like reincarnation. That's kind of crazy, yeah. But when you think about the fact that we're all just meat and that we are composite elements of the universe and that we are all one and we are time future seeing entities that have a role to play in this universe and that we're all one and we're all going to make it together or fail together, you know, the sooner we see that, the sooner we will fix our problems, we will focus on the right things, increase our wisdom, and finally stop focusing on the wrong things and learn how to let go, to unclench that mind that is driving you to be successful like it did me because I was angry too. But first, learn how to let go that metanoia was mistranslated to repent, to imply pain. That metanoia is easy. It's it, it, one thing. Think of it like this. I learned this from uh, being confined in a space against my will for three days. And I learned how to do it. Think of it as a muscle that's in your head. You just let go. You have an off switch. Everyone has an off switch. And if you learn how to turn off your anxiety, you will finally be able to love, and the universe will just be so much better to you. And if we all learn to do this, and we do this, we will actually just fix our problems in the world, because that's all it takes. Thank you very much.